Is it ready? It's live. Morning, guys. Welcome. It's red. It's or it's rule zero. <laughs> Wrong red podcast. zero red morning. Zero. Red zero. Is that a new new thing? Red zero. It's the newest red thing. Uh, yeah, big news. But who cares about that? We're here to talk about sexual strategy and uh, actionable advice. And so I thought for you guys, you'd love this one. Like we had a bunch of guys who were married, a bunch of guys who were divorced in the cast and people seem to love statistics in that. So I thought I was going to bring up an old Dalrock run. I don't know if you guys know Dalrock. Mm -hmm. But he has this great red pill post from like 2010, I want to say. And oh. for you guys in the audience, you'll know what I'm talking about. Cause we just talked about this beforehand. Um, it was about the divorce stats. And this is the first one is uh, the original was from Michael's story. And the point of this one was guys were looking at divorce stats, thinking seven out of 10 times women initiate, which isn't at all realistic because those three out of 10 where they don't, the women basically nagged the guy until he said, fuck it, I'm out of here. And so I was just curious, and it sucks how Paul's not here too, because he was going to be the best guy, because he hates his ex-wife. I guess John, you hate yours too. So, I mean, well, no, time. not not hate. I, I hate myself for like falling prey to the manipulation. Yeah, like fair. It, she it is. She is what she is. It is my fault. In my history, I actually have an ex-wife as well. Oh, really? See, yes. I didn't know that. We're learning new yeah, things I'm all day. Yeah, I'm married for over thirty years, but per that, I was married four years. So my question too, at the end of the at the end of it, then. Was it she filed or did you file, but she had kind of made herself so miserable to you at the time that you thought, you know what, heck with it. I don't want this. If you're asking me, no, yeah, yeah. no, 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 no. This was, remember, this is in the Flintstone era. So essentially she was, uh, she was only 24 years old and uh, all her girlfriends were still in party phase. I already had two children with her of two and four years of age, and okay. she was heavily influenced from the outside. I was a working journeyman lineman, so I was going a lot. Essentially, what she did is disappeared, went on a giant party phase. And Literally so, went out for smokes. Yep. Jesus. And so I took immediate action. I drew up some money, uh, got a loan, a car, and uh, offered the the cash and prizes up front, and she signed them all off. Uh, so what? Yeah, that's yeah. kind of the point then. So a lot of guys talk about who initiates divorce. So in that case, you basically initiated it. But well, on she paper, ran it would off. look like yeah, that, but, but yeah, yeah. I mean, she ran off. Did you really? Did you really? And the funny that's thing right. is, I get along with her great for the last fifteen years. No issues. Well, yeah, so. you didn't have a chance to know her <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> that well. <laughs> same thing. Yeah, you know. But you get to me, this is why I can't stand it. And I don't know if you guys get this same impression when you see guys talking about statistics and that, but that had I just looked up in the statistics, I would have been some grumpy soccer mom going, you see men initiate divorce too. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the statistics, the statistics don't have like how often do girls walk out of the house, grab some cigarettes, never come back because they're busy riding, yep. riding other dudes. It, it makes me wonder because or, I, yeah, had or choice. I had those, those children to protect. And you can't yeah, just yeah. disappear on party phase. But, you know, essentially, she ran off with a member of the band. So <laughs> it wasn't the drummer, though, right? Like that was still the drummer. Mm -hmm. It was Absolutely the drummer. One hundred percent. Yes, that is actually true. <laughs> and it was through a cousin's band that had started to gain traction, which I could not mention the name because they eventually became famous. Oh, uh, but she did. Oh. If I find out this is Eddie Van Halen, I'm going to. No, no, no. Nothing like that. No. <laughs> All right. Nothing nearly as good. Maybe Devo. But I am in Southern California <laughs> and they did originate here. So I, I cannot say maybe offline. I'll tell you. Oh, fair enough. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So like I was I was figuring we take this as a landing off point or a taking off point or whatever the term is. I'm kind of brain fried right now because I just did two hours of this. How many other times do you find in your life that statistics don't map the whole story? And I well, we've got, in, yeah. in recent years, especially with academics, like almost 100%. <laughs> and, well, eggs will give you high cholesterol and heart attacks, and oh. meat's bad for you. Look at these stats. Like, it's oh, yeah, one just egg a is as bad as one cigarette. Oh, yeah, the replication crisis. There's bias built in. But I'm starting to wonder then if that's well, I mean, the, the, the look statistics at who, of who's, it. Who's paying for the study and who's, who's paying to have the, the statistics taken? That's, that's usually... A big indicator and in why certain things that's why oh cereal you're supposed to have this much cereal a week to be healthy that's why they find they find they know what they're doing they, they're paid so to find results, and for the results make cornflakes healthy but they're not it's like one little thing it's irritating very irritating <laughs> what about you jack you guys do it in uh in your stand there you guys are more responsible with your with your food technology and your marketing aren't you are no cigarette ads for you 
Are we? Well, that they are hammering down on the nicotine a lot. Like even today, I believe they increased the prices of a pack of smokes with one euro, which automatically makes the tax increase. So it's one euro and 20 cents, I believe, more expensive than it already was. And it was at eight euros, something like that. So you always almost pay 10 bucks for a pack of cigarettes. And, and do people really do people understand why they do that? No, it's, it's not to discourage you from doing something unhealthy. They don't care. No, it's, it's, no. There are certain things that are recession proof. They're depression proof. Alcohol and tobacco are those things. Yeah, People makeup. will buy them no matter how little money they have. It's a staple. They're always going to make efforts to have the money to buy their cigarettes, to buy their alcohol. So yeah. they just keep putting the screws on you, tighten up mm -hmm. them screws on you because it's like, hey, we know they're going to spend the money on this. Yep. Let's charge the hell out of them for it. Yeah. Does it make they, you a bad person if you collect dividends from Altria. <laughs> but Nothing they, but tobacco and alcohol. They are also making it harder to buy cigarettes. Like you were, you used to be able to get them like at, uh, you're 13. Well, drug stores. <laughs> I watched Bad News Bears with the boys last week. 12 year olds riding motorcycles, smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. But things like, um, what else? Grocery stores, they're trying to ban them out of grocery stores. Last time I checked. Yeah. And uh, they can't be on display anymore. They have right. to be behind this darkened glass case. Where it's like, oh, so you guys don't even have it as bad as here where they have to show like dead fetuses on the packaging or anything. Oh, they have that too. Oh, yeah. They have that too? Yeah. California. Yeah. With a, uh, with a um, little text on it, like smoking causes this. Smoking can cause erectile dysfunction. And you have you, this dad bot looking guy like looking down his trousers. Or, uh, dick. Dick. You guys notice that? It's always after your dick. Even COVID. Remember when COVID was going to cause infertility and then the vaccine was going to cause infertility? Hey, it would save a lot of guys of sex to me. Just saying. <laughs> COVID changed hey, uh, your dick. But that, but that was kind of my point of this. So you get, and this is, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to go, but I'm going to get there. So you get these examples of like statistics and scaremongering and like the cigarette packages showing you this. And then the idea is it has a cooling off effect and it makes people change the way they make decisions. And I'm noticing a trend where it only seems to affect men making decisions against their best interest. You know what I mean? Mm. Well, well, here, I'll expand. Uh, the divorce industry, great case. Uh, Dalrock had a thing called Threat Point. I'm going to put it up here so you guys can see what the hell I'm talking about. I reference it a lot, so hopefully people in the audience aren't too surprised by it. Put it in the chat? Yeah, yeah. Give it here. There we go. No, I put it in the chat. Oh, you put it in the chat. Good, good. So yeah, Threat Point is a great thing about uh, divorce, grape, and all that stuff. And the, the quote here from these economic uh, feminist allies that were doing it is the literature of the economics of the family has been growing consensus on the need to take bargaining and distribution within marriage seriously. Such models of the family rely on a threat point to determine distribution within the household. What that means is when they parade around horrible marriage stats, when they parade around, you know, celebrity divorces that are super acrimonious, like, you know, oh, taking half of his stuff that he's dying in a thing by the river, can't afford to live that it creates a cooling effect on men so that mm -hmm. men stop acting more, uh, having frame within their marriages. They stop acting in their own best interest. They start submitting to the women out of fear, thinking that that is how they can avoid these kind of results. The problem is women get resentful of men who kowtow to them like this. And so yep. it makes it more likely they actually get screwed. The ugly over. cycle. Yeah. And the and big, and here's like the big, okay, we're going to tap it into some, uh, here it is. I'm going to tap it into why I kind of thought this would be a great topic for us. It's a little political, so bear with. Do you guys remember Ricky Vaughn? Yep. Yeah, the Twitter account. He used to post memes about Clinton. Just yep. got accused of uh, of uh, illegal memes. Yeah. Guilty illegal memes. He got convicted yeah. of illegal memes. Count Dankula entered the chat. What country is this in? This is in America. What the fuck? Yeah, yep. he basically put a meme out saying, hey, guys, text your vote for Hillary Clinton or something making a joke of how uh, they were trying to get Trumpers to think they could just text in their votes. And then they tried charging them under like some weird conspiracy to yeah, commit yeah, yeah, some weird espionage shit. or some traitor shit. Uh, and this is why I love talking with Red Pill about you guys, because this here, yeah, it's a political thing, but it's the same thing. They're parading this guy head on a pike. Now, what's happening is everybody who goes online 
is like scared to post uh, any right. type of illegal memes or anything like that because they don't want to no. get hammered next. And all I could think about when this is dudes, had you paid attention to like Rolo and Dalrock back in 2011 <laughs> when they wrote Threat Point or like their version of like, uh, please break up with me. <laughs> Happy birthday, you guys, by the way, Rolo. If Thanks. you guys know anything, Happy hey. birthday. anything, the history of MMA and my relationship with the UFC. Like, <laughs> You're the example. <laughs> You're the yeah, I'm the one. example. Yeah. I am, do not end up like this guy. They they turned on me. They 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 scapegoated me. They 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 turned me into some boring whatever. Oh, this guy never even threw a punch. I'm like top five like most significant strikes ever landed in the UFC history, and I did it in less fights than everybody else in the top ten. So like screw these guys. Like, yeah. But I'm the example, and I've had fighters come up to me. Um, Glover Teixeira came up to me after they cut me in 2013 and was like man i was so scared i'm so scared now like i don't know he like they're telling me straight up they're afraid to like speak out or do anything or negotiate hard on their contracts because of what happened to me like yes there's a cooling effect 100 yeah. percent. they know what they're doing and to steal a line from rollo they're using you as a threat point to get the other guys back on the plantation mm -hmm. yep. and that was the that that's the question i want to get you guys why is this so effective why are men not able to stop against it and why does it take a bunch of retards on this podcast to be able to explain it to guys so that they well, can stop doing it? It's a built-in <laughs> thing. Have you ever seen you ever seen that thing where it's like they have the dog or the animal, and there you, go. you know they're trying to meet, feed it, and the and the stuffed animal they she shakes its head and they hit the animal, the stuffed animal, and then they offer it to the dog or whatever again. The dog eats it real fast. No, I yeah, don't know. That? Uh, they did it with kids and they've done it with kids. They've done it with animals, where like they they put that kind of threat point. <laughs> on on the stuffed animal the stuffed oh. animal does the thing wrong they beat the stuffed animal and they offer it to the kid or the animal and the animal's like oh okay i'll, I'll eat it i'm not gonna say no because i'm not gonna end up like a stuffed animal that's some like bf skinner behavioral stuff i knew about it you know it's funny it's a, that's the um do you remember the um god i hate to even use this as an example do you remember <laughs> the uh the the experiments where they would put like I think these are college experiments. They might have, I think they did them in the, the late 70s or into the 80s, I think, where they had a, um, a quote unquote victim behind like a screen or something or had them on like a, a closed circuit TV screen. And they um, they said you have to if, you know, for every time you give this person a, a mild electric shock. Right, that you will give you like a dollar, <laughs> some sort of some form of reward. Now, this is me, the role of the behavioral psychology guy. So they would give the person some sort of reward. Usually, it was like money or something like that. And then, if you shock them a little more intently, and because what happens, like sort of, it's like the frog in the in the in the boiling pot of water sort of effect, right? It's like little by little by little by little. So like maybe they'll give you like fifty cents for just eh, you know, person's like that kind of stuff. But the more they did it, yeah. like you get a hundred dollars and we're like, you know, they're like, oh, he'll be fine, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so basically what it does is it sort of progressively um, uh, uh, habituates somebody to the point where they're, they're giving like, they don't know that they're doing this, but they would be giving, they technically would be giving like lethal electric electrical currents that would kill the person. Now they don't actually kill a person, right? But like the pe person doesn't know, like they're like, they wanted to see how far they could like get people to like sort of uh, operant conditioning, right? To, to, um, to uh, administer an electrical shock. Of course they did it because they wanted to say that the, uh, the bad people in Germany in 1930, in the 1930s, um, that's how they kind of got habituated to like normalizing um, really threat points, which you're talking that's about. That's a terrifying study because I think I remember reading it where the more the person feigned the pain, the people would become accustomed and, and increase, increase, increase to get that response. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now what we have MGTOW sitting here and there, MGTOW, that whole thing there, I love it. Not no, because it goes I like back that, to that, doesn't it? <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like they're literally the example of how effective it is. There is an entire, I don't know if you want to call it a movement or a bunch of nerds or whatever. But that are sitting there saying the juice is not worth the squeeze because they showed off a couple celebrity divorces and now they're catering their life towards that as like a worldview. It's yep. crazy how easy we are to manipulate, isn't it? Oh my god, yes, well, that's still do Amber. Just saying, I, that's what I get. Yeah, no, that's what I get. As, um, that's what I get associated with all the time is um, the, the fact Austrian painter. 
No, no, no. <laughs> that, that would be a weird not segue. That not that guy. No, I um, I get associated with the fact that like people think that most most red pill those red pill guys they're really talking about black pill doomers and nihilists and are, you know and certainly yeah. not the the praxeology that is the red pill. But like you, pretty much, I would I would argue probably probably everybody on this panel at some point has had. Uh, someone accused them of saying, "Well, you're conditioning guys to like hate women. You, you, if, if only incels like care about the shit that you guys care about, and you are taking guys' money based on their insecurities, and you're just habituating them and normalizing their anger and misogyny and hatred towards women, rather than actually just presenting, you know, factual a factual basis for for." Um, you know, intersexual dynamics. So um, in, in a sense, I think that a lot of people think about the same, um, the same sort of like habituation or the same kind of normalization of the electric shock, but we're the ones who are the, the, not the test subjects, but the ones who are administering the test. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So and it's hard to, it's hard to sort of break that, that impression because you know, good intentions play faith the way to hell. So if you make any kind of money off it, or you spend any, or you like have a book, or you have a, a podcast for yeah. fuck's sake, and the just God forbid you help somebody and make the money. very yeah okay like even with the best of intentions, the very fact that you're presenting these facts is is it implies you as being sort of like the person who is is interested in conditioning people to shock other people, right? <laughs> to hurt other people. Yeah. But that's, oh, okay, we're so jumping the gun. Dude, my talking points are hitting here fast. Mm -hmm. Another Dalrock. I'm actually finally doing my Dalrock research. How the feminine imperative just happens, 2012. You might remember this one, Rolo. You guys may not. I love this one because it basically explains how everything Rolo said happens every single time with the equality speech. In this case, they used examples of like uh, uh, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, which I guess don't exist anymore. Now it's just they Scouts. Just Scouts. Yeah, and they just stay inside. The scouts. Even... There's a crazy documentary about scouts, scouts on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, but, he, but here's the point on it. So when they were all going in for dinner, the girls just cut in line and started eating first. Yeah. And one of the, some of the guys, like, you know, kept guys on the plantation. Just let the girls eat yeah, first. Yeah, you still fine, remember whatever. that shit. That's funny. I, I remember the chick who did that. It was uh, uh, Sunshine Mary, I think, is the chick who was talking about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Taking you back. Yeah, so here's the thing. How old and is then, this? It's 2012. Holy shit. 2012. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a bunch of and a bunch of guys kind of had their little MRA moment, like equality, right? So how mm -hmm. about and they tried to negotiate? Like <laughs> you can't negotiate with terrorists. How about this? How about the girls go cut in line and they get to eat first, but as like a reciprocation, they set the table for the guys. And this is how he makes the case the feminine imperative just happens. When equality is working mm -hmm. out well for women, they're very passive, they're very go along to get along. But as soon as it comes to their side of it, he was like, whether you want like equality or even just reciprocity, then the claws come out. And what happens? Uh, where is the line you put it? I want to make sure I get the lining right on it. He's digging deep, man. Yeah, irrational, <laughs> irrational anger is what he put at it. Yeah. And it's funny because he's talking with it with the sunshine chick. You're right. Sunshine Mary. Sunshine Mary, I remember it just her. appeared to happen spontaneously and willingly. And that's the other problem with this. When we talk about like the, the threat points against men. When the threat point is about keeping men on the plantation, right? Do your duty, be a good father, keep your job, sacrifice for the family. Mm -hmm. Women are just very calm, very calm, very quiet. But then when it comes to the other side of the things, mm -hmm. you know, don't it's fuck our neighbor. Available. <gasps> then the only answer you get, like Rolo was just saying, is irrational, emotional anger. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's crazy, isn't it? Like, look, 10 years ago, this is 10 years ago. Rolo and I are the only <laughs> two people who apparently know this fucking thing exists. Yeah. And it explained everything that you're seeing now in the White Claw Power Hour stuff. Like, and it oh, drives oh, me nuts. It's mm, 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 uh, really coming for us, that's for sure. Sorry, you know what sorry, I mean? Like, we saw this shit. I think, you mean, I think you mean Gen Z dating shows. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, what's your ideal date? Well, I want to yell at her and then give her a big book to read and then give her a quiz on where in the world's Carmen San Diego. I think that's the most yes. romantic and thing. You are a red Dostoyevsky back to front. <laughs> and you she to she really wants the D. Yeah. I love a guy who can name three countries. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, by the way, just just for shits and giggles, like that was one thing on that show, that's the one thing that sort of like bugged me the most. So I told I told Mike Sartain, I said the next time we do the show, which will be like the 13th, I said, we're gonna start the show this way. 
name 15 countries and we both have to name 15 countries and we can't name whoever what the other guy said ah, well, <laughs> that'll be pretty funny yep. i would laugh if sartain gets to like seven and you start laughing at him and you pick up the slack and name the rest for him i probably could yeah Liechtenstein. <laughs> yeah. europe africa Mars, Wakanda, Asia. Australia, Asia Minor. Uh. <laughs> yeah, and then as a fall, and as, so this is my question. I really want to see how we can, like, how do we solve this? We solved it ten years ago. Everybody knows this is the case. Kaoni Galt talked about it in two thousand eight. How to handle this? In this case, it's just don't let yourself be manipulated. Don't let her emotions drive you to other behavior. Don't let this threat point stuff dictate how you act. And we figured this out a decade ago. Rolo figured it out a decade ago. And yet here we are today. Nobody knows shit. I don't know where to take it from here other than wearing my asshole well, glasses I, and yelling so, at the audience. So my observations they know or they don't <laughs> want to know. <laughs> well, I think the, the knowledge that gets out, it's kind of like building sandcastles on the beach. Because the amount of messaging that comes from the mainstream is just waves and waves and waves. So you got to keep building the castle. Otherwise, that that wave, that ocean is so powerful, they just keep washing the, your sandcastle out. It's perpetual, and it is effective. Oh, I can't hold. believe they're able to get information out more effectively than us. That's my fighting style, really. man. Constant pressure. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Put on the neck, baby. Put on right. the neck. <laughs> yeah. I can check. You're the youngest no one. Walk me through it. How do you, how do your guys not notice this stuff? Like I say, your guys, like you're leading oh, of the glasses. under thirty squad. So Come on, guys, let's go yell on the call, the podcast. Let's do it. <laughs> most I'm, most of my guys. Of <laughs> so if I understand you correctly, like how do my associates deal with the whole point of like, hey, if you don't behave, we won't sleep with you, or we'll divorce you, kind of thing, right? That and also not understanding that like guys figured it out and the information is free and it's available. Dude, like everything. Dude, you so. sell books. You sell books. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the date on this? <laughs> it's, like freaking, it's 11 years old. Yes, yeah. So, so was my son. What I tend to notice is that a lot of guys are just poon deprived. Where it's like, I'll take anything. It's like they'll they'll date older. Uh, they'll behave mm. certain ways. Yeah. They'll well, yeah, that's kind of it. But they are just so pussy beggars. Yeah, they're they're so <laughs> afraid to do it their way because they are scared they'll never get anything. And then they'll see a guy like me who like is dating ten years older. By the way, I'm yeah. I'm thirty two. For people wondering, <laughs> yeah, and they go like, oh no, you you just have the broken girls. Like no, you, you just have like you always get the crazy ones with daddy issues. Meanwhile, oh, yeah. I'm a dentist <laughs> assistant. Um, what else? Doctors, assistants, lawyers, shit like that. It's like no, it's not that, mate. It really isn't. It really is all up here. But yeah. they just think that girls who do date older and shit like that are damaged. Low value. They're damaged. They're low right. value. Oh, funny you should funny you should say that. I actually have an essay for that too. Hey, uh -huh. what do you know? You right? <laughs> hey, I never met you, by the way. I heard Ryan talk about Roger or something. Is that Ro you? Rogero Tomaso Tomasini Tomasini. <laughs> happy to meet you, man. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the whole divorce thing as well. A lot of guys don't pay attention to what's going on around them. Like That's how correct. many people are actually divorced? How people? Uh, how many people are actually happily married? They're just happy they're married. Like I got someone. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I got someone, and that's what I'm happy with. And as long as she's happy, we're happy. That's what that's I'm problem, noticing. Though. But every time, every time that you're happy together, she's quiet. But every mm -hmm. time you're happy at her expense, she's angry. And then guys slowly get it whittled down. And that's mm -hmm. the point I'm trying to ask you guys. It's like I cannot figure out. How to square this circle. Guys willingly walk into the meat grinder. They willingly go onto the plantation. rollo has been desperate. ranting about it for 10 hmm. years. Run off of <laughs> uncountless flagpoles have been run up. My I'm goodness. just saying. And it's not even frustration at this point. It's just like maybe guys are meant to be slaves. That's the only thing I can make sense to me. Well, because they want to. Like, what is the biggest driver of too. male competence? 
Well, like, so let's, if you want to distill it all the way back down to um, Big Head Babies, Ryan, the Big Head Babies post by Whisper, which I actually ruthlessly liberated for book four. <laughs> um, but uh, with permission, by the way. Um, but like the Big Head Babies theory, which of course is that, you know, the reason why men are the dominant, women are the vulnerable children are you the fragile um it's because human babies have gigantic heads <laughs> i know this is a hard concept to wrap your head around but uh human beings rely on their intelligence to survive <laughs> or we have in the past anyways i beg to differ sir yeah, yeah. i've come a long way so i mean but so i mean I'll, I'll see if i can paraphrase this as quick as i can uh, uh human being human babies have gigantic heads and so therefore uh they're all technically born premature so what that means is that uh they need constant attention and constant nurturement and food and everything because they're not self-sufficient when they're born in fact they don't even really become like you know hand to mouth self-sufficient until they're about six or seven years old right so they can actually go and find berries and eat shit, right um in our ancestral past anyways so what that requires of us is to i mean it's very much case selection right we have to invest in our offspring and we have to have uh, an invested father an invested mother an invested tribe and um the the idea goes something like this is that men are the strong sacrificial disposable sex because they have to protect the vulnerable women and the fragile children who require somewhere between, you know, uh, six to nine years to be self-sufficient. And but human beings, you know, human females in our past have had, um, a, you know, one or more babies at the same time. Like they're constantly reproducing. You know, we reproduce a whole lot more than, then than we do now. Um, and so to facilitate something like that, you have to have some sort of innate psychological firmware in the man to want to protect the female. And you also have to have some sort of psychological firmware in the female to want to defer to the stronger, protective, hopefully and parentally invested male. Um, so therefore, you have this dynamic where you have the well, what I've termed as the male protector dynamic. And so that's why you see like during like um, uh, active shooting events where men will put themselves in front of bullets uh, between themselves and, and women that they don't even know. So like when you go and you look at, say, like the Las Vegas shooting in 2017, um, largest you know mass killing in the United States still had unsolved, unsolved. Um, but uh, but, but you, there was there are several incidences where uh, men who had knew didn't know the women that they were putting themselves got shot and took a bullet for women that they didn't know simply because they acted on instinct. It was impulse instincts right there, right then at the, at the moment. And they they probably couldn't even tell you why they did it. Now, if, if men have time to think about it, like they're on a sinking ship, well, nowadays, maybe somebody, they, they might think, okay, well, you know, should I or shouldn't I? If you have time to contemplate, that, then it's a different story these days. But like, we have an instinctual firmware that predisposes us to protect women. Now, how does that translate into what Ryan was just saying is that like men like sign up to complicate their own lives, right? Or they think that they're doing the right thing by being sacrificial, by being, um, you know, the the martyr, by, by you know, taking it on the chin, staying together in a sexless marriage for the kids, you know, being sac And there's many ways men can sacrifice and sort of be the, you know, the, the martyr for the I, for the greater good. And that, I think, finds its root in that instinctual evolutionary male protector dynamic. And women understand that men have that protector dynamic and in an era where we live in gynocentrism women use that dynamic to the, they leverage it to their own advantage so for instance rich cooper has said in the past that you know the message we give men is do the right thing and the message we give women is do what's right for you girl and that right there should show you the leverage that we use against men because it's men's duty and honor and responsibility, which is why we, you know, we're constantly harping on responsibility without authority is slavery. Men sign up for their own slavery, but do they do it instinctually or do they do it as sort of a, an act of choice? I would say both, but I would argue this is that women understand that sort of martyr complex or that protector dynamic in men and they use it to their advantage particularly in an era and a social order that advantages women while disadvantaging men yeah oh, yeah there's no consequences i can't even fault them for it 
Why wouldn't you let the guy dive on that bullet? <laughs> Nobody's going to get you mad at you for it. Even her family says thank you. You'll get sympathy for it. That's why you got uh, Hillary Clinton still to this day saying the primary victims of war are women and children. Like she doubled down on that fucking thing right after the uh, right after the Ukraine situation. I she just recently, like not even like a, a month or two ago, like she was saying something almost like identical to that. Um, and the very fact that we kind of nod our heads and go, oh, yeah, that sounds <laughs> that sounds logical. That should tell you where we're at, like as a society. Scary, isn't it? It's just like diabetes. Like we're all addicted to sugar. Because we, cavemen, <laughs> it worked great for. And now look at us. We're eating chocolate cake. We're getting fat. We're dying from it. I'd argue it's the same thing here with chicks. Oh, That's the, the promise of Poon. Very powerful. Yeah, but you see what I mean, though? Like Thor, fitness. Pornography is our chocolate cake. <laughs> Guys have trained themselves to stay off of sugar, to mm. go work out, to be fit. So we can, we can overcome our instincts. But for some reason, when it comes to sex, it's just not happening. It's just okay. not happening. And this is this is me. Like I'm really asking why. And I would love I would love if one of you guys could be like, "This is why you idiot," and then you explain it because I'm confused. And all I know how to do is do a manosphere morning and make Tate jokes. That's my only answer. Oh boy. <laughs> so the, message, the messaging is just too strong. It's powerful. It's been going on for a long time. Yeah, I, I have passed a, it. You're smart. Yeah, but it, it. I mean, it took a lot of. I don't know. I, for one, I'm I'm kind of always been naturally questioning everything i've always been a little bit of a contrarian like if everybody ran over in one direction i'm i'm stopping and being like why well, I, I don't trust most of you people are stupid i'm not following you like if the crowd is all doing something i'm i'm gonna step back because i know your average person isn't that bright i know there's a lot of people that make a lot of mistakes so i'll i'll sit and wait maybe i missed out on an opportunity because I, I wasn't there first but from my experience in my life, I have missed and dodged more bullets because I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to count to three and, <laughs> and see what happens first. I think it's mostly social programming and shaming <laughs> tactics. Could be. Mostly that. Because Rolo has written about that in book one as well. But it's the crabs in the bucket mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of guys. It's the way it is. The way everybody does it. Yeah. Like even, uh, what, what's his name? Uh, Neil Strauss wrote about this where you or was that mystery the robot effect when you start changing and things like that you get an imposter syndrome uh, social robots yeah the social robots where you try this stuff out you kind of feel fake and things like that and you have to go through the rejection which a lot of guys don't want to do either because that's the sucky part the pain period in bodybuilding mm -hmm. but once you get through it you understand all of it. Like, hey, wait a minute. I don't have to abide by these social norms where it's like I have to wife up a single mom with five kids of eight different men. Do the math. It works. And then they finally like be like John, like Thor, like Ryan, like Rolo, where it's like, hey, I don't have to abide by the norm. I can do whatever I like and get what I want. And then they start applying that one question that most guys should do. What's in it for me? Because they don't dare to ask that because of that loyalty and virtue and honor system that is now socially implemented so much. And I almost thought we were talking about trad cons instead of women, in all honesty, because this sounds yep. very familiar. Yeah, well, is. they're the Vichy French. Yes, they are. I think that's you made that reference, isn't it, Rolo, of the Vichy French for these dudes that are like telling you get on the planet? Vichy males. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. They're essentially, I mean, <laughs> That was the, let's see, that was the Manosphere jargon of like, say, 2016, 2017 was Vici males. It's it's really, um, it's it's what we would call sneaky fucker game, like like uh, a male feminist game, essentially is what it is. You're selling out your boys so that you can like, because you think you're going to get put, you're going to get, you're going to get 30, 30, uh, 30 coins of silver for selling out your boys in the, in the female market. Judas males. Are we finally off of the Latin lettering? We can go to like the biblical ones. <laughs> the Pauls and the Judas. <laughs> this one's a Judas male. Wow. Damn you, Matt Walsh. How many men have you sold out for your trinkets? Didn't somebody, I think Jack, didn't Jack somebody is definitely onto make... something with the guilt, with the guilt and the shaming. It, the sign language that's used, it, mm -hmm. it has been for many, many decades. It's increasing. You see men starting to use the sign language of shame, insult, guilt in all conversations. It definitely has a powerful effect. And, of course, most people, path of leash resistance, that's my answer for most of these men. 
All they need is the promise of Poon. And if it's just barely there, they'll go for it and they won't, they won't extend. They won't extend to do anything beyond just what's survivable and comfortable. They're comfortably numb. Yeah. I can't so tell you how many guys that I've talked to six months later, they're back at it. It's too easy just to fit right back in. Well, yeah. Living life as opposed to, or letting life happen to you as opposed to living life. And um, I think bad dog actually, I don't think he understands he's doing it, but I think he's making the point for you. I don't think it's that men aren't getting it. They're responding by becoming sexless and marriageless. There you go. Like this is still the plantation, man. You're still doing <laughs> what they want. You're getting the unattractive men out of the way. So women can pick among what's left. So they don't have to put up with you. There you go. I saw something interesting the other day. It was talking about like hero culture yeah. and the fact that all the heroes are reactive. Mm. They sit around on their ass until something happens and then they have to do something about it. And then maybe that's part of this too. These guys are trying to get this mess <laughs> they sit on their ass and they wait for something to happen rather, rather than going out and trying to make things make happen it. on their own. Dude, and, that explains and even more so that hero culture the villain is always the proactive one. The villain is always the one with plans. The villain is always the one trying to make something happen. That's why Thanos heroes did nothing wrong. The heroes, the, Joker. Yeah, the, heroes, the heroes sit on their ass and wait for something to happen, and they react to it. And now Dude, there's makes... this embedded cultural reactionary mentality. Do you guys remember that shooter video, the guy in Texas who the guy was like robbing the restaurant, and he turns around, shoots the guy seven times, yeah. and then reloads and then executes him? I'm yeah. like, that makes so much sense. He just sat around like, I wish somebody would try that. And the guy tried it and then he did it. And then he put in a new clip. He's like, this is because my wife won't fuck me. And he gives those execution shots at the <laughs> end. Oh, <Jesus>. Yeah. <laughs> I'm almost wondering if that's the case. Yeah, you're right, guys. Or yeah, I'll put up with all this stuff. I'll let the girl go first. I'll 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 suffer. But, you know, one of these days I'm going to get my revenge. And instead of taking it out on the people that are wronging him in life, they find some poor bastard and take yeah. it out on him because he had the audacity to rob a liquor store. I just um, <laughs> it was a it was a clip from a longer from a longer show on Tim Pool, but he was talking about the difference between like Captain America and Iron Man and like Captain Marvel and stuff. I'm like motherfucker! <laughs> I, I, I can't help but think they just listen to this stuff and steal the material, but don't actually give any. I was like, got, I was uh, and I'm like and it was funny because like in the in the uh, in the comments for the clip, anyways, uh, in the comments, people are like, "Man, you stealing Rolo's line?" Blah blah. blah. I'm like, oh, at least somebody recognizes this shit. But no, I mean, the reason why it's even something that's as obvious as that uh, to a guy like Tim Pool <laughs> um, is because right now we have turned sort of the anti-hero is the only like framework that we know when it comes to heroes, whether it's like a superhero or like, you know, military, like yeah, action hero, whatever. Um the guy who is proactive, right? That's why uh, you got, you know, the Joker, which is, you know, you get what you deserve, right? That that's people can like, especially guys can align with that. Whereas, for instance, like old school heroes like Captain America, like uh, I mean, you, you, maybe you could put Tony Stark and Iron Man into that category, but if you look like Captain America, you look at um, uh, Superman. They are they're lawful good, right? They are the they are the um, the epitome of truth, justice in the American way. They do the right they do the right thing, right? We tell our men do the right thing, um, or or they take responsibility for their actions. And of course, what's funny is like when you put those characters uh, like uh, Captain America and and Superman into these sort of moral quandaries, or like like it's uh it's not a question of right versus wrong. Those are easy to answer. It's the questions of right versus righter or wrong versus wronger that put the that sort of put the uh, moral dilemmas on those characters. And it's it used to be anyways. It used to be entertaining because we used to have like uh, the reason why you know Superman gets bitter and nihilistic because he's sick and sick and tired of like saving these asshole humans who will never fucking learn. And he's been, he's like technically immortal and he's like they're never going to change and never you know. So like he kind of gets like sort of bitter and and nihilistic and sort of loses that um, idealistic lawful good you know tendencies. Um, the reason why that's interesting is because it's a I think it's a, actually a cultural narrative where it's like well we. Used Used to believe it's almost like the red pill and blue pill right we used to believe the truth justice in the american way but now we know what the reality of the situation is now and that's the red pill and so for for a character or an archetype like captain america or or even spider-man for that matter um the um 
the, it's the moral quandary, right? Like with great, with great power comes great responsibility. That used to be a cultural narrative in the sick fit. Well, really you could say fifties, but like sixties, seventies, eighties, and then the nineties rolled around and it's like, well, you know, the people who I am doing good for uh, either a don't appreciate it or they're manipulative, you know, opportunistic ass fucks, you know, and why am I, why am I using my great power for and being responsible to these fuckwits, right? That's the that then that that's sort of kind of building up to where we are right now. <laughs> Zeroed so out these, superhero. <laughs> well, like I, I I don't know if you guys are familiar. I, I used to love this show and it was a fantastic show, still great writing, but it was on Cartoon Network and it was a uh, Samurai Jack. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love 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 samurai jack and i couldn't figure out why i love that character so much and the fact is the Great reason show. is he's lawful good he's a good guy he does the good and does the right thing even if the world like punches him in the face for it he still sticks to his guns and still is doing the right thing he's fighting evil and we don't have those uh, those simplistic stories of that's the bad guy, that's the good guy, that's Darth Vader, that's Luke Skywalker, whatever. You know, now it's got to be father and son, and all. You know, we got to complicate things. But if you watch like the first, uh, you know, A New Hope, the first episode back in the seventies, it was very simple and easy to understand and easy to follow. You didn't have to have a fucking doctorate in Star Warsology, right? <laughs> to, to 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 figure shit out, right? Because it was it was the hero's quest, and it was based on myth and everything. It was easy to understand. Um, because we have this these archetypes of like good versus evil we don't have those anymore man it's not it's not like making decisions and uh, that are, are prompted by questions of like say right and wrong right and wrong is easy if you know what right is and you know what wrong is you know how to make that decision but we don't have those anymore it's right versus right and it's wrong versus wronger or right versus writer you know well that's because right and wrong was like a tribal thing it was always good for yeah. the people you associate with and yeah. bad for the people you didn't but that's the problem now like, I think it was you that said that uh, sexual strategies in aggregate are adversarial. Yeah. So now if women are acting as a collective with that social media amplification. It is literally women versus men. Women have decided to get everything and give back nothing. And guys mm -hmm. have decided to yell at women on podcasts. Like, it's not even a fair fight. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's the joke. It's the Joker effect. It's, you get what you deserve. It's pro revenge. That's another essay I wrote. Yeah. Thank you what do they deserve? <laughs> Bezos half of Amazon. So it's like. Yeah. Well, like I'll tell you, here's a funny thing. I, I'm looking at the chat here. Yeah, Gennady, Tar uh, Gennady was a uh, a really good storyteller. Oh. And I'll tell you, the, uh, when he did the the final season of Samurai Jack, which came like years after the end of the end of the run of the show, he did one more season to sort of like tie up the the entire plot line because he was never able to do that on Cartoon Network. So he did that. You have to actually go and like subscribe and buy the by the actual uh, episode of that season. But right. at the uh, spoiler alert, at the end of that, that that whole narrative, everything that built up to the very last episode is a tragedy. The whole thing is a, is a great. He loses the love of his life because he goes back in time and he can't have the love of his life because he has to kill the villain who's responsible for him finding the love of his life. And so therefore it erases her. She just like she she, she doesn't exist in the timeline that he's at. And so he does the right thing and he gets still gets fucked for it. Like in the most royal fat, you want him, you want resolution. You want the whole plot to resolve. And it doesn't because it, it's more like a Greek tragedy. And Dude, that's such a cowboy bebop ending. Yeah. And, and that you guys like when people ask me and, and uh, people goof off with me about like Warhammer 40,000, especially like uh, uh, Magnus the Red and and Prospero Burns and, and A Thousand Sons. So you guys have no idea what I'm talking to about. But like the reason why I'm drawn to those kinds of stories and those kinds of characters is they're tragic, but they're tragic heroes. So when people say, what, what, what books do you like? Well, I like Dune because, because Paul Atreides is technically a, a tragic hero. Uh, definitely say. a thousand sons is, it's, it, it reads like a Greek tragedy. Um, I, I tend to like, not necessarily like bad guys, like jokers. I'm, I'm not, I'm that's, that doesn't like sort of resonate with me, but the tragic hero does. It's like the good intentions to pave a way to hell, but you still do the right thing no matter what, even if it means sacrificing everything. So it's like Iron Man at the end. 
So More or less, yeah. Iron Man is Iron Man is the uh, he's not a Sigma fucking male, okay? No. Just, <laughs> no. just who said that? Male. He's just an anti-social alpha, is what he is. He's a he's a happy-go-lucky. Uh, it's a different archetype, right? Tim Pool, keep if you're watching. There you go. There's your lesson for today. He's you not a not. I'm a Sigma. No, if you no. think you're a Sigma, you're not. If you're even saying and claiming that, you're not. <laughs> Just by just by the nature of Sigma, you're not. <laughs> I was gonna say that was literally in the manual for the for Vox's thing. Like yeah. uh gamma males always think of themselves as sigmas. Narcissistic yeah. personality <laughs> disorders basically uh, gamma male. They're like they always think they're Vox the May? who's that? Yeah. So yeah, we're all up in two thousand twelve today, man. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> hey, what's up, Paul? It's good to see you, bro. Hey man, what's going on? <laughs> oh, we're talking about guys on the plantation and that uh, if yes. girls, if, if equality is working out well for girls, they're passive and they take it without complaint. And then as soon as it involves them having to reciprocate, they get angry and emotional. And guys seem to be okay with like screwing themselves over and they'll never right. listen. And then we started talking about Samurai Jack and I actually got really interested in the series now. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> That's a good update. Well, yeah. yeah. So dudes are slaves. That's you it. probably like, like it. it. Right. They like it because vagina, you know. <laughs> and Samurai <laughs> Jack. Just, that sounds that's interesting. That's just it. Is that the case though? So the guys that are yeah. able to slay, the pickup artists, uh -huh. the thugs, the athletes that can just sleep with girls, pump and dump, are they the only ones that are impervious to this plantation manipulation? And is it the They're case where like guys like Pat Stedman would say, stop your pickup girl, pickup artist from ruining our women. Is it the case that the, the honestly, is it a case that yeah. the dudes that just like man sluts, are they the only ones that can get out of this? Are they well, going to be the good husbands of the future that don't uh, kowtow to this? And if that's guys the case, who, shouldn't we be encouraging guys to get as much dick into whatever as possible? At least having guys, I think we do encourage them to be able to have the ability to do that though. Right. It's I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's abundance. And so whether they're actually executing that, bun that abundance and ruining their lives, which with, uh, you know, we running through party one. girls or, yeah, or if they are capable of doing that, but they're a little bit more selective. The point is, is that they have abundance, right. And that they can get women. Therefore they don't have to put up with somebody who's not treating them right. You know, well, Tiger so Woods had abundance though. That's I, my point. And he's still kowtow to it. Yeah, so I think that's another the social conditioning aspect. part too. It's a mental thing. Knowing, you know, I have abundance. I don't have to put up with this this right now. What what sh what she's treating me like. I think there's you another know, aspect to it besides just abundance. And I don't think we talk about it enough. It's like we like ourselves. Like we're okay with ourselves alone. Right? Life is good. Like I can have an awesome life by myself. I don't have to have a woman in my life to have happiness or fulfillment. Like I have my kids, I have work, I have things I can focus on. I'm at peace by myself. I that, that's most, part of abundance in my mind too, because yeah, you have think, an abundance I know, I of a lot things of guys in your life. Just you know, aren't capable of. They're not happy alone. You know, they're miserable alone. They think they have to have something else in order to be happy. They don't have that internal validation, and then. At, that when they can't have that by themselves, when they do get somebody, it's impossible for them to think about being alone. Well, the, I think uh, the, the reason why they're a lot, well, first of all, there's the male protector dynamic, as we said. So there's a natural predisposition for, for wanting to have um, a woman or a child or a, a pet to take care of, to like sort of, you know, in some way fulfill, a, uh, like I want to say an evolutionary or biological purpose. So that is, there's the sort of the nuts and bolts too. I think the other part of it is we, because we raise our boys as if they're defective girls, because we live in a gynocentric social order, we, and because we live in the feels before reels uh, society, we, we prioritize emotionalism and emotion above rationality and above anything else. We, we have to remember that happiness is an emotion. And one of the things that I've been harping on recently and I will continue to is the fact that we have this very unrealistic, if I, in my opinion, stupid way of, uh, of idealizing happiness. And that happiness is like a state. It's like a place you get to. It's like, a, well, once I get my my degree, I'll be happy. Once I make $100,000 a year, I'll be happy. Once I find this, you know, I finally marry my eight, then I can fuck her all the time and I'll be happy. And then, they, you know, 
that's what gets me is like when guys say, well, you know, uh, when Ben Shapiro pops off about, well, you know, having sex with a lot of women won't make you happy. His no, because you're, 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 yeah, no, but ha- when I am in the act of having sex with them, I'm very happy. <laughs> That's the problem. It's like, yeah, it, you'll never be happy because you'll never be content to begin with. It's, there is no like goal state, end state of sustainable, maintainable happiness because human beings are simply not built that way. And that's actually a feature, not a bug of human nature. But we, ever since really, I would say since the sexual revolution, you know, on the feel good Pepsi fucking sunshine, you know, age of Aquarius generation, Mm -hmm. everybody's looking for this suspended state of happiness. And to the point where we will medicate ourselves either with SSRIs and antidepressants or with alcohol or with, uh, with weed or with whatever your sedation happens to be because, oh, well, this makes you happy. And people say, well, what's your problem with those guys? As long as what they're doing, you know, why, why does their happiness like uh, bug you? And it's like, no, it's not happiness. It's just that's that's where they're at. It's not, if they're not in a sustainable state of happiness because happiness, emotion, sadness, anxiety, name the emotion. Emotions are meant to prompt human, well, any animal, but human beings from one state to another state. But as long as we keep saying, well, if you do this, if you believe this, if you get this, if you buy this, you take this, you will have a fucking sustainable state of happiness for the rest of your life. And that is bullshit. It is selling you a fucking freeway that doesn't exist. It's when you're in. That's why what I agree with John. John just said, I've got my kids. I've got my MMA. I got this. You named a whole bunch of acts. You named a whole bunch of things that you do. When you're doing those things, you're fucking happy because the state of doing those is what makes you happy. Not having done them, it's the fact that you're in the middle of doing them right now. Which so kind of like, answers Josh's yeah, question. I'm, I'm happier about the things I'm currently doing than I am about things I've done in the past already. I don't sit around jerking off about championships. Yeah, it's want. present moment stuff, right? Yeah, and that's the thing, you know. You have an, when you have a when I say like abundance too. I don't just mean like having a lot of women to bang. Um, that's, you know, having the ability to do that's part of it, but just having within yourself, like abundant resources, you know what I mean? To be fulfilled and to be good, you know? So it's, you know, you, you have it within yourself, the capabilities of being happy and you do the things that make you feel that way. And that's independent of, of, of women. And so now that, you know, a woman doesn't have that kind of power over you now in a negative way when you're good on your own or when you could replace her or where, you know, you could, you know, break contact and go to the gym or go uh, hang out with the boys if she's, you know, not acting right. Right. And so it just gives you that power instead of her having all the power because guys have these attachment issues and these emotional issues and they're afraid she's going to leave and all this stuff. And they're afraid of what might happen, you know, if they get a divorce, it's like, <laughs> look, that's how she has, that's how she gets put in charge and she doesn't want to be in charge. That's the reality of it. She doesn't want to be in the driver's seat. That's not her evolutionary imperative. That's not where her hind monkey brain feels the most safe and comfortable. So when she's in charge and in the driver's seat, she's going to act like a crazy bitchy person. You know, she's going to enslave you. She's going to do, you know, that's an enslavement. She's going to give you. She's responsible for her own security and her own long term security. That's why. And what it does. Yeah. To the question with Dev there, Rolo. It's a it's a confirmation that you are dead weight. You're basically a child because women take care of children. Men take care of women and children. If you are the functional equivalent of a child, then you are. That's you're just one more mouth to feed. You're yep. one idiot to take care of. You hear woman. women say that too. They complain. They go, well, it's like having another kid. You oh, know what you I mean? Want mommy? You want a girl <laughs> who can clean and cook and clean up after you and do your fucking laundry? I want a girl who <laughs> yeah. wants to do it, that. Yes. Do I need one? No, but it would be nice like, I, to make to uncomplicate my life and make my life easier and be a compliment to my life. You're fucking right. I do. It's like when she has two kids, but she's married and she says, oh, I've got three kids. It's like, oh, well, well, men are just big, big children anyways. Yeah. If, if you hear that come out of a woman's mouth, that's a red flag. Run like fucking hell out at that point. There are certain like, you know, what gets me is like I was just talking about this with a personal client of mine. Um, 
when we talk about red flags, if you go on on Twitter right now, it's like, oh, does she have any piercings? Does she have a septum piercing? Does she have too many tattoos? Does she have a strange looking hair? It's like, yeah, those, those are fucking outward signs. Does, does she have a does she has she been sexually assaulted or graped in the past? That's the bigger flag that you need to start. Look, I don't care. She could look like the perfect Bible school Amish Dutch country little girl. If she's got that in her past, that's a red flag. Bye. See ya. I'm not your savior and I'm not going to untangle your head. Right. Run. Same thing with a with a, a woman who has this uh, this uh, opinion of men that they're just big children. Bye. That's that's a bigger red flag than tattoos. That's a bigger red flag than a septum piercing, right? Those are things, those are cues that are not visible that you have to be sensitive to. And you're like, okay, recreational use only, but those are more important. Character flaws like that are more important than like, I don't know, fuchsia hair. I don't know, man. That septum piercing, that's a big one. I mean, come on, that thing's hideous. I don't know. I don't have any problem with girls with tats, by the way, but just saying, you know, it's, but that's the rocker in me. Um, no, I, wouldn't, I wanted to uh, put up Dark Knight Devel, Dev's thing back up. Uh, right? Dang it. I uh, unstart it. So if I can find it. But oh, the gist of it is, he was I got saying, it. I girl learns I more money. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, I, that's what uh, the girl makes a hundred thousand. You make 60,000, right? Then during, if you get graped in a divorce, well, she earns more money anyway. Well, so okay. So here's the, here's the thing is, is it depends on how she came into that to making more. What, did you get into the relationship when she was already making a hundred K and you were making 60 K that's a different situation than if you were both making 60 K and then suddenly she makes a hundred K. So there's a context that goes along with that, but I do agree in the sense that you have to have other things going for you. So, once again, let's go back to the, is it the, this wasn't Del Rock, it was um, Deddy's, uh, 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 he was he was actually a commenter on Del Rock's, I, I've quoted him several times in essays, but what he said, when we're talking about hypergamy, when you look at a, like men ha don't have an attraction floor, women do have an attraction floor, they, a, a, a female seven or six does not want to get with a guy who's a five. And if they get with a male six, he better bring a whole lot of other side benefits mm -hmm to that to that pairing in that relationship she'll get with a seven no problem eight oh that's ideal man she will like she'll go do his laundry for him and make him a fucking sandwich right but if the guy's a six that's when you get oh men are big babies men need this men need that uh i can't tr it goes back to what what uh what uh, paul was just saying a minute ago it's like they have to be in the driver's seat because they have to be responsible for their own security if she's making a hundred thousand and you're making sixty thousand but you're jacked and juicy as fucking Robert Frank. <laughs> you <know? laughs> uh, if you uh, if you have a, like that would definitely be something that would raise your sexual market value. If you're the man that other men want to be and other women want to fuck and she just happens to make more money than you. That's a different situation that if then if you're just this lazy piece of shit who sits at home and watches Sailor Moon and eats pizza and fucking down, you know, a six pack every night. That's. That's a different situation. So do you have to be on top of your game? Yeah, you do. But I wouldn't be in that game in the first place. But if you are in that game, just understand that it's not just about the money. It's money, muscles, and game. Just because you happen to be like a little bit deficient in the money side of things does not mean you have to be deficient in the muscle side and the game side. So, Right. It's all about how she feels. Assuming anyway. you want to be in that situation in the first place. So. Well, that's just it. Most guys do want to be in that situation. Yeah, they'll that's sign up part. for it. Yeah, yeah but, they'll sign up for it. Or they'll, or they'll create rationales for it, Ryan. They'll be like, hey, I mean, I'm just fine. It's, it's great being with a woman who makes $40,000 more than me. I could tell you all the kinds of benefits. It's great. We go to Aruba and have like icing on a fucking cake, you know? Yeah, and so. I have a drinking problem I don't talk about. And I have hookers <laughs> on the side. <laughs> all these different coping strategies just so they can convince themselves of the lie. And that's what I'm wondering is like, I almost want to say it's nothing. I hate this about the red pill is that since I've been here, genetic determinism is now like a thought in my head and it never used to be. I always hated the idea of the Germans were right, but welcome you, brother. Like well, how we many have, of these guys there do you are think some, are just There are some bees? laws around, around, you know, genes being passed on. We've had extensive studies done on fraternal and, uh, um, what's the other one? Identical? Yeah, congenital twins. Oh. Like we know oh. this, we know, we know you you take two identical twins and raise them separately. They're they're more alike than uh, uh, you know brother and sister twins uh, raised together. They're also you know brother and sister um, raised separately are are more like each other than two people raised together who are not related DNA wise. Yeah, let me jump in on that though. So I, they haven't done the study. It would be really cool if they would is to have two twins 
that had been separated at birth and then teach one game <laughs> and pick up <laughs> and then have the other one just be yeah, like no dorky guy you know, at Disneyland there, Paul. <laughs> well, we know we know that naturals <laughs> exist. There are guys who are naturals at picking well, up. Well they just learned it early. So there's accident. a good chance that if one is a natural and they're not raised together and they're raised <laughs> right. in really separate environments, he's still gonna yeah. have a game. Yeah, sure. If he's a natural, but I mean if not, what you're gonna see is great, huge differences because Yes, there's this genetic. There, there are gen, there are signals that a man gives to a girl that says, "I'm the genetic option for mating," and game is all about being able to send those signals through your communication, mm -hmm. through your body language, your confidence, the way you live your life, all you that mean, stuff. Fake it. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. And, and to be exactly. fair, Paul, if it was it. genetic, if being good with game was genetic, then we would we all shouldn't even be here. You yeah. So about. we kind of all agree that it's it's environmental. Right. Well, and it's a skill. It's a skill you can learn. And that's mm -hmm. that's the thing. I mean, you can learn. It's really just learning a type of communication. And some people are more more genetically predispositioned to be good at those skills than others. But even some of the worst cases, I've been able to work with guys and I've seen other people work with guys, take those guys into a place where they're just doing really well. And so, I mean, if you're willing to learn the skills and do the work and of course find the right person to teach the skills, cause that's also another thing too, because there's a lot of grifters, a lot of BS, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like, there's a lot of, you know, you, we've seen them, the million lay count drunk at Denny types, you know, what? Denny's type. million? You know, like, is that it, what it's, it's like now? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think it's a million. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think, does he have enough knuckles to put like the like, seven oh, digits? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you know, but we've seen all this, you know, the, the stuff where even if the guy has, you know, even if the person has some skills on their own, like depending on who they are, a lot of them don't do well at teaching it. They don't care about who they're, you know, who they're training. And so, you know, these guys can go to somebody who knows these things and who, you know, who cares about what they're doing and actually get results. Right. Put that, put, the four, put that up there. The four behavior. So I just put it on. A, I shared my screen. Oh, this one. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> That's uh, this is exactly what you're talking about, John. Yes. Yeah. The four laws of behavioral genetics: all traits are partially heritable. Identical twins reared apart are more similar than fraternal twins reared apart, who are more similar than non-relatives reared apart. Second law, and by the way, all of these, I've every single one of these is backed up by like Steve Stewart Williams and all kinds of studies. So just throwing this out there. That's why they're called laws, right? guys? They're not theories. It's called a law, just yeah. like the law of gravity. Law of effect of the genes is larger than the effect of the shared environment. So this goes to what you were saying, Paul. By oh. adulthood, tw identical twins reared together are little or no more similar than identical twins reared apart. Ditto adopted siblings. So is there something to be said about social like learning? Yeah, absolutely. But mm -hmm. the, the effect of the genes is more significant than the effect of the learning. Uh, third law, a lot of variance in behavioral traits isn't attributable to either genes or the shared environment. Identical twins reared together, shared genes plus shared environment aren't identical, not exactly identical anyways. And then, I mean, genetically they are, but like as far as personality and everything else, they're not um, and then this is why they're saying this is the laws of behavioral ge genetics. So it's the it's the effect of genetics on behavior. Uh, law four, which is probably the most controversial. Mm. Most complex traits are shaped by many genes of small effect. There are no common genes that increase or decrease IQ by, say, five points. But there are hundreds or even thousands of genes that increase or decrease IQ by a tiny fraction of a point. All of that sort of intent, all of that, you know, together, we're working together. And by the way, that's also, that's not even so necessarily um, uh, the traits. It's also arguably homosexuality, too. So, <gasps> yes. So, so you weren't born <laughs> that way, but you might have been, uh, but you might have had enough genes that would predispose you to seeing homosexuality as a way to at least solve your reproductive problem, even though you're not actually reproducing. Is that the and epigenetics thing? Is where is the story hour and then you're hooked. 
Well, I'll tell you, whenever I, get, whenever I get into like these arguments about like human nature, and I'll tell you right now, man, if I ever, if, if, if destiny or God forbid, Alex from playing with fire or anybody else decides they want to come out to Vegas and like sit across the table from me, you better be able to, you better know the four laws of behavioral genetics. Cause that will be the first thing out of my fucking They mind. don't teach that at Reddit university, sir. They won't. No, know. they don't. <laughs> Twitch, Twitch no. university, Twitch versity. Yeah. By the way, totally off topic. League of legends and talk out of your ass <laughs> totally off topic can we give rollo some credit he is going to do something that even i was like dude are you sure Against about this her judgment I, I wouldn't do it if oh. i didn't have like actually it's not me i'm just facilitating it right. i'm a facilitator in this mr numerologist coming in to argue against red pill with the power of mathematics it's not <laughs> it's much red pill though it's like we're, we're good. the argument okay so the debate I'm, I'm gonna run this like a real debate you, you I'll, I'll show fact. Hold who, on. Who are you bringing I'll, in? How I'm going to do it. Oh. Actually, hold on. Okay, hold that thought. I got to show you this. Yeah, he's bringing in numerology <laughs> man himself. Numerology. Who is psycho. Who is ridiculous? I, it's this guy. His name G33 or something like that. He's a big numerology guy. The only reason I knew who he was was during our initial Anthony Johnson dust off. He was okay. in there acting insane. And when I heard, <laughs> saw his name come back again, it's like Trump running for re-election. This, this is how we're going to have a debate. This little one little device right here. Let's see. Oh. What does it do? do, 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 do. Oh, look. Oh, it's wow. A timer. So we can just so you get five minutes. OK, I, 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 uh, I can't sorry. filibuster an argument like you do on the Internet. They that call it an anti-Hafiz widget. Anti-Hafiz <laughs> widget right here. <laughs> one That's cool. Bay or uh, Amazon. No grand <laughs> standard. <laughs> Trust nice. me, there will be no fucking filibustering on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just informative. Say a bunch of emotional stuff. Well, that'll be yeah. good. Yeah, well, you got five minutes to say it. And if you yeah. can't say it in five exactly. minutes, then yeah, you, you got you to be clear and concise. Under the under the from Texas. <laughs> Dude, imagine guys arguing with their wives like that when she wants to run her mouth and cry and bake and it like hit the timer. <laughs> yep. You got five it's minutes. to. It's definitely going to work for most relationships. <laughs> All right, honey, that's it. Let's have it. Give it to me now. <laughs> okay, my turn. Here we go. Yeah. In fairness, Paul, I do do that. Like when I used to walk home from work, my girl and I both worked downtown before this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she used to come and bitch about her mom and her day and like all oh, girl things. I'm like, my my timer was like, as soon as I walk into that door at home, and that's it, yeah. we're done. No more arguing. <laughs> so the timer technically does kind of work. It yeah. does. <laughs> I usually just start having sex with them. That's, that works my, too. that's my dance move. It does that work? You know, that just stops. <laughs> so so here, here's right. Paul. Okay, good night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hit the five minute timer. I'm oh, yeah. almost done. That's only time, right? <laughs> We're done. <laughs> and but so, that was I, two seconds, I know. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I actually have to correct myself, or maybe not. I remember I keep telling you guys the manosphere doesn't exist. Like uh, Jezebel or Mother Jones put out an article in 2012 to lump us all together in a collective mm -hmm. so they could basically judge us all by the behavior of Roosh. Do we exist now? Well, yeah. no, like the term manosphere. It's just uh -huh. augosphere, but they wanted to shit on men. But then I'm seeing December 20th, 2011 by Dalrock talking about manosphere. So I'm kind of like, it's close enough. I'm going to still consider my statement right. But I should say 2011 then and not 2012. Yeah, back it up. Yeah, but here's my lead in for this one. So he's talking about his frivolous divorce overstayed in the manosphere. And this was, again, I can't remember who did this one. Which one of his fucking female arguments? Can I use manosphere? Oh, Michelle Langley, author of Women's Infidelity. Basically saying it's not bad when we cheat. Here was the thing he was saying. Like, I get what she's selling that, you know, women are the victims and men are horrible. And then when I talked before about the Boy Scouts, essentially, women don't like unattractive men trying to hit on them. So they create all this divorce rape crap. And then the guys go MGTOW and they basically check out a relationship. So great. Now girls don't have to deal with creepy guys. Then with the guys, they get them to sacrifice everything for them. So they get what they want out of it. And then they, they scream and shout once the guys ask for reciprocity. The third tier of this shit sandwich is in this case, please break up with me. Girls who want divorce, don't just don't just say get divorced like seven out of ten are. But there is a not insubstantial amount of women who just make life as miserable as possible so that men are finally like, fuck it. They cheat on her and she initiates divorce or they just initiate divorce and leave anyway. So my question that I posit to you guys is like, were men ever in charge? Because girls are deciding when we get into the relationship. Girls are deciding when we even try to get into a relationship. And girls seem to be deciding when we get out of the relationship. Mm. Well, and so at what point right? did were guys ever in charge? Because I'm not, and don't give me the whole 
uh, arranged marriages shit because like the mother in law was one yeah, picking the that one. She's the one calling the shots. She's yeah. the one well, what you had, so, which, which yeah, you and is this red pill thing us know. finally getting off the plantation? Sorry, Paul, it's all yours. Yeah, I was gonna say what you have is an exchange, really, right? Like so women are, you know, default slow really and all this stuff. They're the selectors, generally speaking, for who is going to mate with them in order to have the babies. So in some sense, that makes them in charge in a way. Yes, men could use coercion and violence and all that. But the reality is it's not very effective when it comes to rearing the children and maintaining the health of the children and, you know, not having like a, you know, forced abortion or, you know, being cocked or any of that stuff. So having the girl actually want to sleep with you is the best way to ensure your, you know, your, your paternity. And so in that sense, yes, you know, women are sort of in charge of that, but what's it in exchange for, right? Because back in the day, she couldn't take care of herself or take care of the kids or protect herself on her own. And so she had to have a man that, or men or tribe that would be willing to do that for her. And so the exchange for her, you know, vagina <laughs> is an exchange for that, you know, that protection and those resources. And that's on the transactional side, but we've developed neurochemical ways of bonding with each other that are make us make it genetically beneficial for us to do so. And so she has that those those means of bonding with a guy to feel better, to feel safe, to feel good all of those things. And so she's getting those things idealistically in exchange for an agreement for the sexual exchange. And that's where the guy has the power. So it goes, you know, back to a simple concept is that she controls the sex, but he controls the commitment, right? That simple concept makes sense because that commitment is what allows her to have safety, security, a good life, you know, all the, all the things that she would want outside of just the sexual exchange. So it becomes an exchange, but really what's more valuable if a guy has a lot of sex options, then her offering sex is not as valuable as what he has to offer. And so if the guy wants to basically have power in his life and power in the relationship and have polarity. So there were the polarity exists where the girl's actually going to be happy and want to stick around, he has to have what he's offering in his commitment be more valuable than the sex that he could get with her. And here's the cool thing about that. Gentlemen, we have AI porn. I can have a three-headed Japanese girl with 12 fingers, you know, uh, in an, you know, in, in, in a, some sort of virtual reality situation and create whatever sex I want. So her vagina is now less and less valuable. Promiscuity makes that less and less valuable. And so oh, like, I'm not power, buying that with the AI thing though, Paul, remember how sex bots were going to level the playing field or I don't VHS really tapes? think they're going to change it, but you know, yeah. I'm making, I'm being humorous, but uh, the reality yeah. is though, we got, guys not, will, I'm guys not like, guys so guys women, I have an AI three headed girl. No, yeah. I'm not really right. But the reality is we have a lot of outlets for sex and no, we do mm. want, it's not just the sex, it's the desire from an actual woman. That's where the uh, driver is for us or else we would just go to those outlets. But we have, you know, the ability to do that um, because women are more promiscuous and women, women are more open to that sort of thing. So women have given up power, actually. And so in exchange for giving up that power, what they've had to do was, you know, they've had to try to use other means, you know, to really maintain control, social conditioning, shaming men, mm -hmm. feminism, like all this stuff, because the power of their vagina doesn't have the power it used to have, I think, you know, because we, we actually have more options than that. If a guy would just realize he does, you know what I mean? Well, and so big thing Rolo talked about that. They mm -hmm. pretend like we don't have options. Teach right. us that we don't have options. Show us we don't have options. That's Promise what it is. We don't have options. What was right, that? and the, the red pill is saying, "No, you, you guys, you have options." <laughs> oh <laughs> shit! No way. Thank you for us, thank you for street, what uh, taught men uh, to deliver the things that women say they don't want, but, but actually do? <laughs> well, forget, well, how, how's that go? No, they teach teach men to behave uh, in a way that women want, but men but don't. They they have the fact to teach them 
the skills what they say they don't want but they do what they say they don't want to, but that that men that men say they don't or don't really have <laughs> oh that's what, i should have used that the way i always put it was uh nothing is better than having hot sex with a cool dude than making sure your friends don't think you like hot sex with a cool dude <laughs> yeah but, was, but i like I, yours better so P once P i make it rhyme it was, it was actually i think it was it, i want to say it was rsd that said this was so you know pick up pick up artist teaches men to uh display the behaviors that women say that they don't want <laughs> that they actually <laughs> do, that they actually do uh i got this one for you though this was actually from i have a another rollo essay since we're on a hot streak here um this was from a, a um a post I had called the key masters, which was in response to the gatekeepers of, you know, commitment and sex. Right. And this was a, actually, I quoted this from Roosh before he lost his mind. Um, uh, a popular manosphere saying is that uh, women are the gatekeepers to sex and men are the gatekeepers to commitment. I wish this was absolute truth, but it's, but it is not uh, as a collective. Women are often gatekeepers to both sex and commitment. Most men reading right now can surely attest to the, their failed attempts to secure commitment from women who they slept with. And if you poll the entire population of men, uh, you may find that they are the initiators of monogamous relationships more often than women. It only makes sense for this to be true. It's way more damaging for a man to have his woman sleep with another man or, and get cuckolded than the other way around. The 0.5% of the population who are skilled players and have more say with the commitment don't put a dent into this common reality. As a sex, Men have very little say in determining the relationship dynamic. That, again, goes back to the Briffold's Law thing. It would be a nice fantasy for us men to believe that we have a say in relationships and sex. It would be nice to think that our alpha behavior and our game determines how re uh, a relationship can proceed, not necessarily how to get laid. But often it doesn't. We're just giving the girl what she has already decided on. You, do you really think you're selling uh, televisions to customers who came into the store uh, with the intent to buy bicycles? The girl who falls in love with us wanted to fall in love with us. The girl who had fun with us wanted to just have fun with us and so on. And even if a girl wants a bicycle, she still wants a certain kind of bicycle. This is why game in a number is a numbers game because girls are incredibly picky even when they are sexually when they are sexually available. The horniest girl in the club who decided on having sex will still have her pick of the litter and opt to get the best that she can get. Well, he makes a lot of great points, but I can see the narcissistic delusion uh, already filtering through that little prose there. Okay, so, why is that? So, so explain. Yeah, yeah, because he assumes that there is no re – we'll call it a real human connection – whether we can, we can boil that down to biology, but when people have emotions and for each other, which is a biological thing, mm -hmm. a girl sees a certain guy more special. Do you know what I mean? Maybe than another guy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes her goals that she thought she had ends up changing because of that emotional connection attachment. Now, if you're a narcissist and you can't attach to other people in a normal way, then his idea makes perfect sense, which is that they come in, it's totally determined. They want what they want. You know, they get the sex when they want the sex and then they decide they want the love and they want the love because everything is this robotic decision that I'm making just for me. And there's no human attachment involved. <laughs> but, yeah. so let, me, uh, let me throw Let me throw a monkey wrench in there. Women, sure. don't, women don't invest emotionally in a guy unless he clicks off a lot of those priorities in the first place. So you don't get to the point of an emotional investment. Like you were saying, you know, there's, you know, if, yeah, if you're a narcissist or there's like, a, if you're robots, yeah, I would agree with that. But the fact is, is you don't get to a relationship, at least on the female side of things, unless you click on, you check off at least a few of those things on the 436 bullet point checklist. <laughs> Right. And, and, sure. and in the right order, depending on how old that woman, you know, what, what phase of maturity she happens to be in. So you don't even get to the relationship and have that emotional connection or you don't even get to the point where she might change her mind about things. If you don't already check off some of those things on the list to get to that point, thus preempting the whole, you know, genetic determinism side of things there. I mean, it doesn't even have to be that. It could, it could be social determinism, too. You know, like I want a man who gets I want who has the bag. Right. Well, well yeah, yeah. It might be a social. I would, I would say the standard deviation, though, widens on what the what she's willing to accept or not accept on that checklist based on her emotional connection. But, see, but, then, but then how do, but does that then 
um, does that mean that the guy has leverage because he's the guy who's going to say, no, nah, I don't want a relationship. Uh, you know, I just want to fuck. Right. Or no, nah, I do want a relationship, but you got to change some things. And you have like sort of leverage because you are the quote unquote gatekeeper of, of, of part of it is him setting standards. Yeah. I mean, you don't get so, you know, for, for, let's just, pres- let me, let me just clear. Let's put time chronologically. Let's, let's say we're already right. in a relationship. Okay. Okay. You would have to have gone through all the steps of like getting through, you know, the, the bullet point checklist to get to that, that position where he would have leverage in the first place. So what right. Roosh is really saying is like prior to that, you're most definitely not the uh, arbiter of, or the, you know, of the gatekeeper of commitment. After you're in that relationship, whether or not you stay or you go, then maybe you have some more leverage at that point because she has an emotional investment and she will do different things because she's more emotionally attached. I thought I was the only one that referenced your guys' talk. <laughs> now you're referencing it. No, yeah, competitive monopolies. It's like that's why uh, treat guys think that relationships are like banks when they're okay. more like restaurants. Yeah. Until right. she picks your restaurant, then you don't get to decide. Well, yeah, she menu. has to pick you, but I mean, it, it starts to at that at that point. It's like. pressing those buttons in the beginning from the initial contact. You know what I mean? It's the attraction. It's the desire. But I mean, this assumes that like she's already, it's already predetermined by her framework, like where she is going to, you know, basically I'm just talking about like she wants to settle down and that's what her framework is. That's what it sounds like he's saying is that if she's, if she's got the, if she's got the framework of relationships, settle down stuff, then she'll be willing to settle down with you. If she just wants to go out and party and get laid. That's that's the difference between the T buying TVs and buying bicycle, right? Right. If if she's in a particular time in her life where she wants commitment, meaning she wants a, a a bicycle instead of a TV, you can sell her all the TVs in the world and she, you're still not going to, or you can be, pitching it all the time and you're still not going to sell her a bicycle because you just simply don't have the bicycle so she's not even in the store to begin yeah. with to get that me and i know that's kind of a bonehead illustration way to do it but the fact is is if she's not looking for what you're selling in the first place no commitment's going to happen there because you don't even get past the point of where she can make an emotional investment right but that's the likelihood like for example so you let's look at your you know your list you know, your, your timeline, right? Like, so let's say she's the 21 year old party girl. So the likelihood of the 21 year old party girl being commitment minded. Yes. Pretty unlikely. She's not in the right phase of her life, but there are, I'm still getting you. Sorry. Hi, Ryan. (laughs) (laughs) But, but it's still, there's still that element of pressing the right buttons and connections. So she can be, it happens all the time where a girl meets a guy who she assumes is just, you know, party guy and she still wants to go out and she ends up like getting married to that guy. You know what I mean? Maybe not in a couple of years or whatever, like it might take her more time than the 30 year old, you know what I mean? Because her initial framework isn't commitment minded, but people do, there is a standard deviation uh, when it comes to what blocks need to be checked when attraction jumps into the picture. I'm I'm sorry. You're losing me. I'm trying to follow you, but. It's all it's I, I'm in my brain's fried right now. It's it's, it's coming across as vague. Minus like, what two, triggers? I might not be making sense. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me before you answer that, let me throw something else out here too. Is like when we talk about like the, the hoe phase, the part of you yeah, yeah. eighteen to twenty eight ish. You're not going to hear women say, oh, men have fragile egos and they only want to marry little girls that, that they don't care about it that much. The only no, time you hear that is from women who are like 29 or older. Yeah. <laughs> right. Most likely it's like you know, in, their, in their mid 30s <laughs> when you hear that, when you hear that uh, uh, men just want to men, they get mad at Leonardo DiCaprio for banging 25 year old girls. Right. Exactly. Like that fucking Girl Scout girl, reference. Yeah. They loved yeah, so. it when they were 23 getting it, but now that they're 30 and they can't get it now. Right. It's well, and but, but right there though, illustrates why do they get mad? Because men have power they want to it. select someone else though. Okay, yeah. Okay, That's right. yeah, exactly. Good observation. But let me let now let's, let's rewind the tape. Let's go back in time a little bit. So you got a woman between 18 and 28 and she's in her party years, right? Okay. I would argue that the reason why the most, the, the, most common age of first marriage, at least in the United States, it's actually later in the UK, but it's like 29 years old, right around there. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. The reason for that is because that's the time at which women finally realize that they're not necessarily going to hit the wall, but they can't stay in the same to, at the same level of competitiveness as they were when they were 22 or 23 years old. So what is that? So, okay. So if the medium is the message, then their actions and their behaviors and the most common sort of um, 
popular concepts, you know, the zeitgeist for Gen Z or for that, that particular demographic is going to be different than when she's 29 and she's older. That's how you get like the Tommy Laren effect, right? She was, she didn't have any problem being a party girl or whatever, right up until she was 28 years old. And then it's like, where's my fucking man? Right. And, <laughs> and so, but the, what I'm saying is that it's not like when you hear women try to rationalize during the epiphany phase, they try to rationalize what they did from the time they were 18 till they were 28. They're like, Oh, so crazy in college, but that, uh, you know, I'm done having my fun. You know, I, I had fun, but now I want to get serious. So no fun for you. Right. <laughs> um, and so it's, I think a lot of women would like to backwards rationalize the, reasons for why they did what they did during 18 to 28 when in fact they were holding out to find out whether or not they could get a better guy a bigger and better deal right up until the clubs the lights came on at the club right and so it's not like they might have found a great guy who was ready to commit at 23 years old but they wouldn't do it because she's got another five maybe six more years of potential before she actually has to make that decision. And that's why you see the average age of first marriage is 29 years old. So it's yeah. not about your fucking career. It's not about your schooling. It's not about starting your business. It's not about your journey of fucking self-discovery. It is simple <laughs> pragmatism and running out the clock to the last minute. And as right as Dal Rock would say, stick the landing. Yeah. So if a guy wants co is commitment minded, like I, li I, I rather prefer LTR scenarios myself um, just because I just like them better, you know? Uh, how, old, how, old are you, Paul? how old are you, Paul? 45. Okay. So would you say that your age is sort of like, were you like that when you were 35 or 25? Um, when, when I was younger because of social conditioning in my 20s, I first got no, married. You look way younger than 45, but just go, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in my 20s because of social conditioning, I thought in order to be a good guy, I'd have to wife this girl up. And But really, I didn't really want that. You know what I mean? And not necessarily. Now, as I got more, even you know, then I got out of the marriage in my 30s, I didn't really want a commitment. As I had more experiences, though, with women, and as I had basically had a lot of different notches, experiences, some of those good, some of those not so good, whatever, um, I, re I realized that better access to higher quality sex with lower <laughs> maintenance happens in a commitment where I frame. So I, I prefer an LTR commitment with the openness of bringing in other girls into the picture. That's, that's so no, it's a more of a soft harem. I and mean, I've been doing that for a decade now. You know? open, open on your end, close on hers. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. And, and so that's, that's my preference. That's where she seems to be the most happy. That's where I'm the most happy. And that seems to work out. Now a girl who is commitment minded like that. I mean, I agree with you Rolo because I tend to look between 25 to 30. Well, I really don't put an age cap on it, but what happens is the probabilities are greater from a girl between the age of 25 to 30 and more leaning towards like 27 to 30, 31 where she's still really good looking, but now she's in a commitment mindset. Whereas the girls that tend to be short-term flings or, you know, an add on to a threesome tend to be 21 to 25, 26. You know what I mean? So it does play out that, that the, the math adds up <laughs> in that regards. I'm, but I just, I, there is the element when you look at the outliers, you know, the other sides of the statistics, there is an element of attachment that does play a role. That girl who's 22 and a kid. So I have these young guys who are coaching me, right? They'll have a long-term girlfriend. They'll hold the frame. The way that they run that relationship though is different than like a 35 year old. They're not thinking about kids at that point. You know what I mean? They're not thinking about a future. He has a very much a, you know, take it or leave it mentality with these girls and they'll maintain a commitment because the ir irony is he's not trying to be in a commitment. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's he's out doing his thing, and he he demonstrates the relationships. His, in other words, right? He wants the well, relationship he it or compromise it. Exactly. He well, demonstrates he's the higher value option. So uh, I gotta she has that out option. so much faster. <laughs> yeah. um, let me let me just chime in here real quick because this yeah, is something yeah. I talked about on my last show, and actually I talked about it on Access Vegas. Um, 
I've, I've just recently sort of been rolling this around is that women are the advertisers and men are the sellers. They're the pitch men, right? They have to sell themselves and prove themselves and have a burden of performance and they have to prove their quality and they have to say, hey, look, my product is better than any of these other motherfuckers product, right? Whereas women, on the other hand, they're not pitching themselves, but they are advertising themselves all the time, which is why women don't want to give up their Instagram. They don't want to give up their OnlyFans. And it gets even worse if that woman is making money and her revenue stream is dependent on her advertising herself and so that's why you don't that's why you get like the soft launch you know or you in you know and it, women don't want to show even women who you know are dating like the top top tier soccer players or dating ronaldo they don't put pictures of him on their sh on their on their instagrams it's only just them when you can see the same picture in the same beach and the same bitch and, and ronaldo on his right and so <laughs> what that says to me is that that like like for for a guy to say, hey, I'm I'm dating this girl. This is my hot piece of ass, right? People go, oh, you want that for eye candy and validation and everything. But we don't say that women want validation when we show them on the same beach and the same vacation, knowing damn well that their boyfriend is right there. And they we don't say women want validation because they're trying to, uh, per you know, present the image that they are fucking single and sexually available, right? So what happens is when we talk about like open on my end, closed on her end, closed on her end, whatever. Um, I mean, traditionally, my the way my marriage works is closed on my end, closed on her end. You'll also notice that you will not find my wife on Instagram. You will not find her on Facebook. You won't find your shit. Won't find her on fucking OnlyFans or Tinder or any kind of fucking. And you know, people TV. are trying. Right. <laughs> yeah, and God knows they've tried. Um, but then, like, I'll listen to to Paul, or I'll listen to like Tate, or I'll listen to uh, like Myron, or or Justin Waller, or hell, even um, even Mike Sartain. Closed on her end, open on his end. Right. Meaning like I can go bang other bitches but, and you can bring girls to the bedroom if you'd like. That's fine. You know, I'm, I'm all about that. But it's closed on her end, on all her ends and, op or, and open on my end. Well, if you think about it, the way that we work it, like the most common um, arrangement right now is that guy has to sacrifice his ability to go and pitch and to actually be like, because we would call that cheating. If you're flirting with yeah. a waitress and you're with me, then what are you doing? You're pitching yourself as if you're available. You're pit. You're trying to fuck it. You're trying to fuck the waitress, right? right? So that's that's cheating. And then there, that's that's grounds for termination of the contract. When we say, ladies. Uh, I want you to stop, even if you were to vo vocalize this, but when women, they don't, it doesn't even, it's not even a concept in their head to not advertise anymore. So when a woman gets in with a guy, it doesn't even occur to her to take down her Instagram. It doesn't <laughs> occur to even, even if she's going to keep it up to put his picture on Instagram because she knows she'll lose market share in the sexual marketplace by doing that. She'll lose followers because suddenly she's got a ring on her finger. Suddenly she's got a boy, a guy in this, in the, in the, in the, in the, the pictures, and now she loses followers followers and she loses likes and, and people just sort of like leave her and go to the next girl who is presenting the image of her own availability because that girl is advertising the other girl has now compromised her advertising yeah. so yeah. so essentially what that is is it's closed on the guy's end but open on the woman's end because she right. doesn't even think not to stop advertising herself so it's still open for her and closed for him but if the guy says, I want you to stop doing your Instagram, I want you to stop advertising yourself, he's the <coughs> asshole. But is that not effectively the same thing as cheating? Because if the guy was flirting with the fucking waitress, we'd have a problem with that. But if she's flirting with God know what, 3.4 million followers on Instagram, presenting the, the per perception that she's still sexually available and she's still hot and, and funny, even though like she's with you and there's a ring on her fucking finger, is that not cheating? So it has to do this is on your end and open on her end. And I would argue that that's more common than closed on her end and open on your end. Oh, or way more common. Both of our ends. <laughs> yeah. Way more common. Well, you know, and that's because she wants the security, her security of her investment is the ability to replace him. Mm -hmm. Right. So if she can replace him and take as much as she can from that relationship, that gives her a sense of security. She well, stays in it as long as she can. For security, but then she can leave, take what she can get, and me, secure uh, another me, part. Makes, I'll give you the real short version of this. The, the yeah. reason I'm bringing that up in the first place is because the guy who is selling closed on your end, open on my end, that right. guy is selling TVs. 
right? If that <laughs> woman is not looking, she's looking for bicycles, which is closed on both our ends or open on her end and closed on your end, whatever that arrangement is, she's going to probably be best. looking for those bicycles rather than the TV of your, which is, your TV does close. Always. On They're, They're never on looking for the TV, bro. Yeah. They're, They're never sure. looking for the TV. Never but looking if, for the TV. Yeah. but um, if you like, if you are like, but look at how cool this TV is and you're a really good salesman, they're like, well, shit, you know, maybe I will get that TV. It's like, Paul's what ends up happening? TV. <laughs> well, so I mean, what, what, I'm not saying you can't make an, in fact, that's the, the essence of game is to make an emotional yeah. connection with a woman, like an association anyways, negative right. or positive. But yeah. the thing is, is that's, Difficult again, that's, do, that's, though, that's, 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 that's brinksmanship on, on guys, on guys' parts. So yeah, yeah, could you make an emotional attachment with a woman to the point where she's like, yeah, I don't usually go with fat fucks like that, but you know what? I <laughs> something, something about that guy, you know? <laughs> and that depends on whether that's a bot or whatever. By the way, so Ryan, I, I, we, we got to wrap up, but br br uh, Ryan, I have to point this out. Did you have you seen the pictures uh, or the videos of Tate where he's uh, pay, pacing back and forth and he's, you can tell he's put on some a little bit of weight since he's been in, in prison? I, I tried not to. I tried. I forget. I, I think it was yeah. noble if somebody said, "This is what women think of when they say I like a dad bod." Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, too, 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 it's too good. <laughs> it's true. It it's true. That, that's what they think a dad bod is like. Uh, so, what is a good look like? Like Chippendales dancer. <laughs> Yeah, dad bod is just some water weight. It's, it's just I don't, water I don't know why weight. people yes, listen to yes. chicks because like everything yes. they say is self-interested or water a flat out lie <laughs> or something that they're emotionally convincing themselves of and it never yeah. helps. It never helps. Even my girl, been together for like what, 13, 14 years? I don't even know anymore. We're at that stage where I have to count, like do math. And even now, she'll still try to convince me like she wanted me to buy a candy dish and she starts laying it on thick and I'm like, she's still lying to me. <laughs> I don't want that fucking 1970s broken glass candy dish. <laughs> but it's like, it's always the case. And in case you TVs and bicycles, which one was Alpha Fox and which one was Beta Bucks? It was a little too abstract for me. Well, yeah, it, why not just, if just, a girl's into party you're phase. In, you're not in the market for a TV and you're in the market for a bicycle. It doesn't matter that you're selling TVs, right? It's, it's like, she's not looking for what you're selling. Yeah, if I she wants hot sex, analogy, lean though, into your really alpha offering. stuff. If she wants provision, lean into your beta side. It's. I'm surprised guys make this complicated. You have a chart. <laughs> Epiphany phase, 20 to 20 to 30. Right. I love it. And then just, yeah, you lean <laughs> on the alpha fuck side of attraction and you'll attract those girls in that phase. And then if you're with that same girl or with a new girl at the epiphany phase, you add some more of the beta things. So like add some TV or add some bike or whatever the fuck. I'm sorry. I I really had a bad night's sleep last night. I should have been able right. this better. But so, no, but the, the sales pitch though really is her realizing that her security isn't in securing replacement, but her security is in having the relationship structure that you present her that she gets Your her best needs options. met mm. with yes and that she gets all those needs met and that by closing off other options that makes her more secure less likely for discard by having you know a soft harem that makes her now an integral part of that like why would you dump her or why would you cheat on her or trade her if, she, if you, you know, could be with other women with her, you know what I mean? And that's the sales pitch. It's, it's like, it flips around. It's all there. You know what I mean? It's all how they perceive, you know, their needs getting met or not being met. And, uh, but you do have to be, you do have to be the option for her. You do have to do what you can with what you have to check those blocks. You can't just game your way out of, being a fat loser, you know, or something. Right. And so, or, or if, if you have bad genetics, bad genetics, you know, I, you know, I got my, my friend, uh, my, my, my friend up in Toronto there, uh, you met him, Justin, you know, Justin slays with slays, dude, slays with women. And he is an Indian guy who is five foot five. Like he, it's, you can't, you know, there's a range of options you have, even with, when you're not given, let's say the genetic lottery and you don't fit the Chad mold, you know what I mean? You just have to, to find what it is that makes you attractive to women and build that up and really just build yourself up because fuck what women think. And then that makes you more attractive to women. And then you, be, you, you become the option, you know? So Paul, right? are you saying it's possible to actually put a TV on a bicycle? Yeah, like that's what I'm right, selling. A bicycle. I saw I saw it. I saw it real. Wrap it up. It's getting ridiculous. We gotta wrap. We gotta wrap. Right. <laughs>
TVs and bikes. And offers Hulu. And with that, we were done. <laughs> yeah. Here, Rolo, start us with the lead out, then rotate to Paul and okay. around. Let's give like a quick where everybody been, and then we can. Uh, so get let's back see. To the weekend. So I got some bad news for you. Like tomorrow's my bad, my birthday show, and it's going to be the last the last show I ever do on on YouTube. I'm done. That's it. Are you serious? Really? Shut the fuck up. Oh, it's April Fool's. <laughs> You're such an <laughs> asshole. I'm a, come on, I, mean, I, I, I was believing it, dude. You had me. Like, you had me for I'm like five minutes. I'm depressed. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of fucking bicycles and TVs. Fuck this. I'm out. <laughs> dude, I, you totally had me. I forgot what today was. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will continue to be the uh, god emperor of mankind. Um, I Yeah, there's, that's your real uh, April Fool's. <laughs> Uh, yeah. No, tomorrow is actually my birthday. And by the way, you guys are all invited. I am going to, if you're available, or if you drop in for five minutes and say, hey, happy birthday, fine. Um, so I'm just going to like pass around the, the link to all my, my friends in the sphere because I have never done a birthday show. It has never fallen on a Sunday. And so it happens to April 2nd is my birthday and it happens to fall on a Sunday. So I'm going to do a uh, birthday live stream and I'll just keep it going. I'm just probably going to do like Q and A's and just like go around the horn and talk about shit. That's in the, in the, the red pill news, red pill potpourri. <laughs> um, but it's my birthday. It's my birthday show. It's my birthday. So um, I will pass around the link to oh, well, everybody in this, in this chat for sure. Um, but I will, um, uh, put it in the the rule zero DMs and you know pass it around to some select people who are friends of mine if they want to come in and just say hey shoot the breeze or something kind of thing but it'll be a, a casual stream it'll be a Q and A thing I might even open it up to I might be stupid enough to open it up to uh to people in the chat too if they really want to chime in but uh, I don't have a I might actually have to put Sam Bada as my, my call screener because who knows but anyways that's what I'm doing tomorrow. Um, the next Access Vegas show will be uh, April 13th. We have a lot of interesting guests coming. And by the way, yes, I am. We are going to do the quote unquote debate with uh, Gary and the numbers guy on April 26th in Las Vegas live. Uh, it's I'm going to be more of a moderator, by the way. I think I need to explain that to you, <laughs> Ryan. I'm I'm this guy right here. I get I, I'm the one who's going to go. OK, here I'm, I'm not it's not like I'm not going to chime in. I will. But I want to make sure that we have like an actual like where nobody's talking over each other. It's nobody's filibustering like Hafiz would do or some shit like that. So um, so I'm going to try to keep it as like as, uh, you know, structured as possible, because I think that that people will appreciate that first off. Um, and then um also, it's kind of like a proof of concept thing because it's been my uh, policy starting this year, really. I mean, once I got you know the ball rolling with Access Vegas, I'm like, if people want to debate me, fine. I all the doors open. All you have to do is come to Vegas, sit across from me, do it live on my channel or Mike's Mike Sarchain's channel. If you have a channel, guess what? We can live stream to all of our channels at the same time. So it's not re pre-recorded. It's all done live. We're sitting across from each other and I will school your ass live in front of everybody else. So Destiny, um, uh, Alex from Playing With Fire, uh, Hafiz, uh, who else hates me? <laughs> 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 but see, you know, I'll tell you what's funny is I've been saying this for a while now and the only one to take me up on it thus far has been Gary's a numbers guy. So uh, kudos, bravo to you, my friend. You, you actually stepped up to the plate. So um, that'll be on the 26th of April. And then again, the actual uh, Access Vegas will be on the 27th. Uh, I will also, uh, you know, f in the future, I will be out in Miami right around the 18th to the 20th, somewhere in that week for the Bitcoin convention that's going to be out there with Miguel and them. And we'll be making the rounds on podcasts and stuff as well. Um, the books are coming along nicely, and I do mean books. I got, I got two sort of in the process right now. Um, the Maxims book is really what I probably will release first because it's, it's easier and it's, it's kind of like a, it's a one and done. Um, I've got another one that I'm working on right now. I've decided to, instead of making it a series of essays, I'm actually going to make it into a small book. So I've got another another idea, another project that I'm working on. So that's coming up. And um, I think that's about it. So I'll shut up. Nice. Polly, take us to the hinterland. Huh? All right. Well, all I really have to announce is I am uh, working with John from Modern Life Dating on the Inner Game Healing Summit. And I will post the link right now in the chat and um, it's super cheap to get into actually. And it's going to be a bunch of webinars helping you guys with your inner game and all those things that are holding you back. And uh, we got some other people. I'm a keynote presenter and we have other presenters that are not a whole bunch of presenters, like four, four presenters 
other presenters outside of me. And it's going to be, it's going to be pretty sick. These guys are really good. I've seen what they're going to be presenting and it's really kind of the, this whole mindset and how you're framing things mentally is sort of the key to having the emotional self-control you need and framing your emotions and then framing your behaviors, you know? So the results you're not getting that you need to be getting all comes down to what you're doing up here, which is resulting in how you feel about things, which is also resulting then in how you're behaving and showing up. So um, it's really a good program for you guys. And like I said, it's, it's low cost, uh, lowest cost to get into is right now. Um, and if you get in now, you got the telegram chat and then you have the webinars we do each quarter. So, cause we're going to be doing them for four quarters. And so you'll get in at the lowest cost with the year long benefit and accountability uh, that that program offers. So that's the only thing I really want to push today. It's uh, it's just such a good opportunity for like a little less than 300 bucks. You can't go wrong with it. You know what I mean? So nice. go ahead hit that link. All right, Johnny. Yo, um, <laughs> I've got it done. I've got it up. The uh, practical self-defense course is available. I'll put it in the chat right here. Uh, learn how to not get your ass kicked. Learn how to be safe, stay safe, <laughs> right? Nice. You need this. You need to know how to do this stuff. Um, we are, you know, I'll cover some, um, you know, avoidance things, situational awareness, de-escalation tactics, and then we'll get into um, some hand fighting. There's a lot of hand fighting here. You're not going to do anything on the ground. This is all stand-up grappling. Um, this will change your mind about a lot of what you think it would work in a fight and what actually is something you can accomplish and keep yourself safe. Um, so check it out. Uh, get some friends together. You can do this stuff in the park. Get to get to get, get to work because uh, it's getting dangerous out there. Dude, I'm excited about your course, by the way. It looks sick. I've seen some of your clips where you're talking about practical fighting and stuff, and mm -hmm. it was it was yeah, good. Gonna, it, gonna, it, 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 it checks out. I mean, not just because you're a pro fighter, but it, you do know clearly know how to apply ring stuff to the street. You know, which well, is I, I got thing. the uh, my uh, uh, modern combatty modern modern um, combatives um, uh, certificate yep. uh, level right. four uh, yep, Mac yep. P the Mac P program. Yep, yep. Yeah. Back, you know, back in 2011. So I've I've right. had a lot of that. I've worked with police officers. I've worked with um, uh, special ops people, and and I've learned a lot. And yeah. there's a lot of misconceptions about what you're going to do in a self defense situation. You're gonna you're gonna armbar somebody, or even even throwing punches, you risk breaking your hand or breaking getting your hand, knocked yeah. out yourself. Uh, you're much better off getting away. And if you can't get away, you're better off forcing a clinch and dominating in the clinch and creating and using that to create space or uh at least re restrain the other person yeah dude it's right. sick i watched those clips that you had and i was over at myself i was over at jsoc um that you know that training facility you've probably been there if it's mm -hmm. uh, been in north carolina and um you know doing the sock pee program and i was like doing knife stuff or whatever but i mean i'm not you know level of unarmed combat skills as you are but you you just you know you know your shit man i just want to get that endorsement out there um it's yeah. not just fighting, some, fighting is fighting yeah. the objective the objectives are what changes right for sure for sure man yeah i was impressed nice we'll sign up for that and then tell us about the the den the g-spot <laughs> inspector hey how you guys doing and rollo congratulations on your birthday tomorrow you're going to be eligible for all these fantastic senior discounts that i've been enjoying for a while <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome to uh, the get recognized in perkins next time i'm there with they, the AARP AARP card. they, they do take our aarp card for a 10 percent discount so you know <laughs> we'll hey, do man, that so with i'm still using my triple a card <laughs> There you go. Hey, I'm not up to too much. I'm just uh, buried in edits for my book that someday will come out and uh, uh, preparing for the dragon ship in 40 minutes. Come and join us there. And we're going to talk about um, how to defend against modern sign language when you encounter it. Nice. So I tried nice. to redirect to it, but yours permissions aren't set up. So it's set up to uh, the other guy. Mark, I think it's the one who's streaming it as well. No, who? <laughs> It, there's like three people streaming it right now. There's you, Correct. 
And there was two other accounts that I don't recognize yet. So, but I don't realize it says the G spot the Spectre on your big plan. It's, it's probably Glenn Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. Anyways, that's it, guys. Enjoy yourselves. You want to tell me why the majority of people that voted yes, I can be submissive are men? Just want to talk a little bit about why I love women. And the majority that said no are women? <laughs> I would love y'all to ponder that for a fucking second. I love how. You know, they always make sure, by and large, they shower. The feminine energy that that girls put out, it's just, it's magnetic. You think I can be submissive? I adore it.